Up next, a review of the Legacy of Lopan expansion for Big Trouble in Little China. All right, first, I do need to note that I was given a review copy of this expansion from everything Epic Games at Origins this year. Uh, no other compensation was provided. Legacy of Lopan was designed by Christopher Batarlis and Boris Polonsky. Features art from Henning Ludvigsen and was published by Everything Epic Games in 2019. Now, it's important to note that all of the content in this expansion was originally included in the deluxe version of the Big Trouble in Little China board game. Now, that was published in 2018 after a very successful Kickstarter. Well, the best way to see what you get with this expansion is to watch our unboxing video on YouTube that went live just today. How about you tell us what you get for those who haven't checked it out yet? All right, well... When first opening the box, the first thing I noticed and was very surprised by was the fact there's no miniatures in here. Because the the main game is kind of basically a miniature game. It's pretty much a miniature-focused game. And I was honestly shocked to not find any miniatures in this expansion. Yeah, this was at the time really shocking. And even now, knowing that I it had been a part of the original Kickstarter release, somewhat disappointing. Where yeah. is the bearded Lopan? Should have been in there. Uh, plus other reasons. We'll, we'll get to the miniatures later. Now, what I did find is a ridiculously thin board overlay uh, folded in half. This this thing's poor, like, for, for component quality. Uh, it's, it's really not impressed by this piece for something that's meant to cover part of the main board while playing. Um, there are 10 more red character dice. Uh, these are the exact same as the ones from the base game and are meant to be used when playing with five or six players. There's also two grill tokens that are the front of the Pork Chop Express. Uh, two red pegs, two blue pegs, all of this there for the same reason, to play with more players. Uh, there's also a small red clip uh, in there with a baggie. Uh, red clip that, again, not the best component. Now there's the punch board that has some of these tokens on it. also has a bunch of new tokens to be used with the new scenario book. And one larger low pan, sorcerer low pan boss board. Again, all these match the quality of the original game. So the still, still the same solid quality, thick punches you got in the first game. No, no complaint on the token quality at all. Yeah, no, the components are fine. Uh, the, except that overlay is yeah, a little the bit. The token components are. The, to the, the, the overlays. player boards are great. It's just yeah. that one overlay. The one overlay was a little, little chintzy. Uh, there are two packs of cards, some Hobbit size, some regular size. The regular size are all kinds of new random quest cards, as well as a little setup reference card. The Hobbit size ones are new rewards and a new set of Chinese hells. Finally, we have the campaign book. Now, this is the same physical size as in, you know, I don't know what you call it. It's not A4, whatever it is, digest size. Book is the main campaign book and almost as thick, which is impressive. Uh, this does contain the new rules, which are really short at the beginning, and a new branching campaign scenario that you can play instead of playing the base game. So it's worth noting that while these cards can be mixed in with the original content, uh, or most of them anyway, you might not want to, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So what does this expansion add to the Big Trouble in Little China board game? All right, the most basic thing it does, the first thing it does is ups the game to six players. Now, the original game did come with six characters, but you can only play four of the six characters in any one game. Note, this expansion doesn't have any new characters. It just has the bits, the dice, the punches, the, the little, I don't know what you call them, pegs, that let you play with all six of the original characters at once. Now, this is actually really nice, uh, and kind of a shame it wasn't in the original game. Because it, while it undoubtedly changes the difficulty of the game, it's a very casual and co-op game, so more people at the table is not a bad thing for the enjoyment level of this game. Uh, the other thing you get is uh, new cards to add to the base game. So there's 11 new side missions and a handful of new hell cards. Now these, literally, you can just take and put with your base game. Now the hell cards are worth noting, though, because they're called, they, they, they called them social hell cards. And what they involve is the players at the table doing something outside the game or else they get an in-game penalty or they have something outside the game that gives them a bonus. Things like you must talk in an accent all the time or if you happen to have green eyes, you get a bonus in-game. Now, personally, out of the social cards I've seen so far, and I haven't read them all, I would leave them out of the game or at least curate them very carefully. I was not overly impressed with them, but then I'm also not that kind of social gamer, so your mileage may vary. Now, these additions to me are interesting enough, like they add to a six player, fair enough, they're cool. 
But the real thing, the meat of this expansion, the thing that most people really want to would care about, I think, here is this new scenario. Now, this scenario is in the form of a campaign, like a full campaign style of play. Uh, this has the players traveling through time to rewrite history by defeating Lopan in the past. It's meant to be played by the same players each game where your characters are going to advance and should take two or more sessions to complete. Now, while they do say two or more sessions, you could totally do this in a single setting if you had enough snacks, <laughs> drinks, and a solid block of time. I don't know that I'd recommend it, but it's totally doable, and we've even discussed potentially doing it at Extra Life next year. Uh, one thing to note is there is no mechanism for uh, saving game information, mm -hmm. so get your cameras out if you are going to go uh, jump between uh, you know, sessions. Yeah, that was something I actually missed that on the, the written review that I published earlier today. The game expects you to put it away and take it back out, but gives you no way to do that. That is a, a little frustrating. Uh, what's interesting about this new scenario, and I actually found rather fascinating, is how it literally replaces the game you already own. It, it's almost like buying a second game. It uses the same board and minis and components, but has a totally new way to play the game featuring a much more story-driven style of gameplay, which the story has some branching, branching elements as well. And it's weird because, like, you leave... It almost felt like half of the components of the base game in the box and don't even use them. It's mm. also worth noting that they give you two different difficulties you can play at, which is kind of cool, including what they call the story mode, which to me really makes me think of video game story mode, and that's pretty much what this is is you are going to play on super easy so you get to see the whole story, which is an interesting addition. Yeah, we were pretty frustrated during the setup at how few components you actually got to use in the new scenario. We just felt like we kept putting everything back into mm -hmm. the box, more so than we were taking out of the expansion box. Yeah, you definitely, you put away more than you get in this new set. So it ends up that wasn't a bad thing. I don't think in any way. Like, I wasn't missing the stuff, but man, when setting up, it's like, are we even playing the same game? And well, the answer is no, you're not. Um, so overall thoughts on this. Um, we're not going to break down how to play all this. It's basically the same as the original game with a new story. You're still doing this, using the same mechanics. But I do want to start off with the fact that myself and the other five people who have played this game with me shared the experience with us and actually had a lot of fun playing through this new campaign scenario. We were laughing, we enjoyed the story, we honestly had fun. But this was despite many problems that came up during our play of Legacy of Lopan. Yeah. Now, one major caveat, I think, is that we all love the movie. We all watch it, we all still watch it, yeah. and it has a basically a sentimental value. Uh, if you don't know and love the movie, well, I don't know why you would have bought this game in the first place. Yeah, very true. Uh, like, you might be playing it because your friend loves the movie, but no, I don't think anyone's buying this game. Uh, it didn't win any Ennies or uh, Origins Awards for Best New System, so I'm pretty sure you're already a fan at this point. Um, so, unfortunately, getting to the bad, my first disappointment, which I already mentioned above, was seeing what was in the box. This is not a cheap board game expansion. We're looking at $39.99 US. At this price point, you're, you're at, like, I could buy a full game for that cost, not an expansion. I can go out and get a game with miniatures and a full game, right? I expected to more from this box. First of all, the minis, right? Like, I, like even when I first opened it, I was disappointed there were no minis, but like when you play, there should have been minis because you substitute miniatures for things. Like there's a scene where you're fighting lightning and lightning uses lightning to s resurrect some Nazis, which is pretty cool. But then you put out spirit path warriors, which look like terracotta warriors with swords. Like, come on, you're using Wing Kong hatchet men as Old West outlaws. Like, at least give us, like Sean said, the, the Sorcerer Lopan model, right? The big bearded, low, like, give me a main boss fight, at least. Yeah, the sticker price for me is kind of the deal breaker on this. This is maybe $20 of content in a $40 box. Now, admittedly, there is a lot of story here, and writers need to get paid, but we'll get to that <laughs> as yeah. we move on. Uh, this comes to the second problem. Um, every single one of, uh, not the second problem, but the rest of the problems, really, every single one of these could have been avoided had they just hired a, a developer and an editor, possibly the same person, possibly different people. The amount of grammatical and spelling errors in this book was honestly embarrassing. Like, that, 
it felt like a first draft. There were sentences so bad they did not make sense, and we shared around the table, do you know what that meant? And we couldn't figure it out. Now, Sean was playing narrator, so I'll let him expound on the, the problems of the book. So we decided, for better or worse, as you can see in our AP videos, that I'd be the voice of the game. Don't worry, I did not do any racial or character accents related to the game. Some Australians may have been inadvertently <laughs> insulted during this playthrough, however. <laughs> but the game was, at many points, just giant blocks of text for me to yes. read with no gameplay. But that text often required me to edit and substitute words and thoughts in real time when I wasn't just deciding to read verbatim and highlight the glaring grammatical errors that were being presented to me. So then there was the fact that, well, there were huge swaths of text might have been workable into an interesting script for a prequel, it didn't actually match what was happening on the board in front of us. Yeah, because the grammatical stuff didn't affect the gameplay, right? Yeah. But for a campaign all about the story, it definitely takes you out of it, right? Like, you're here to hear the story, and you can't even read the story because of the problem. But like Sean just alluded to, this is nothing compared to the disconnect between that story and what was actually happening on the table. You emerge from the smoke in the basement of the restaurant. Move all of your characters to the street. Yeah, exactly. Like, while playing, there will be times when the story indicates that all the characters are in a room together, yet your miniatures are all over the board. Or one of the first times that really stuck out is we had a scene outside, and despite the fact it said everyone's outside and someone was still back inside the building, it talks about how these police officers come around the corners and surround us. And then it has us spawn miniatures some right in the square we're on, and another down the street out of line of sight. What? Or a bomb goes off, hitting everyone who doesn't defend, even if only one person's in the spot with a thing and the other person's the other side of Chinatown. You'll be told to slide a progress marker on a track that doesn't exist anywhere. There is no track to slide the progress marker on. Sometimes, just sometimes, the narrative will actually say your characters are in a spot, and the game will actually have you move your minis there, but this is literally the rare exception. Like, I think it only happened three times during the entire campaign over, like, seven chapters. I personally found this extremely maddening and frustrating. If you watch the actual play, you can hear it in my voice. I was getting really annoyed by this. Uh, doubly so because it would have been so easy to fix. Like, did no one playtest this expansion at all before it was published? Like, this was so blatantly obvious right from the first part of the game. Like, how did no one notice this and be like, hey, everything epic, I, uh, what do I do? It says we're all here, but we're not, and, and do we not, what? Like, how? How did that not get, how did that get past development? How did that get past playtesting? Now, along with this, toss in all your usual editing problems and ambiguous and missing contradictory rules. Like, I would go so far as to say this game is a mess. Like, this book is a mess. It, it's almost unplayable. Yeah, I don't think we're understating things here to say that a substantial rewrite is needed. Not for content as much as clarity, grammar, and connection to what's happening on the board. Now, all this said, all right, if you can overlook these flaws and your group is willing to house roll things or go with the flow or just go with the narrative and say, well, it's that we're all in the basement. Let's put us all in the basement. There's quite a bit of fun to be had with this expansion. Like, the mechanics work. There, there's nothing wrong with them. Actually, I'm impressed by the dice pool system in Big Trouble in Little China. I said that when I, when I talked about the original game. It's actually a really unique system that works. Um, this campaign is really cool because you actually get to level your character up, which is something when we played the base game happened a bit. But, like, we all had our characters to a level six by the end of the campaign and got to make some cool, meaningful decisions. Now, we did run the story on easy yes. or story mode. Now, this is specifically just like in a video game there to make sure that you get to experience the game without fr the frustration of too many hells piling up on your character. We chose this option because we did want to experience it all. But honestly, again, on the other side, we found this almost too easy. When we did get to the end, we still had a huge stack of the tokens that are used to get yourself out of trouble um they're sort of you know your fate points or whatever you want to consider them in other games uh and we were pretty much all maxed out uh we had one character who had 
you know, hit the max and rolled over three mm-hmm. times. Um, and that being said, we also accidentally, through our story choices, skipped two chapters of the, yep. this expansion. So for whatever reason, they may have overdone it a little bit on how easy the story mode actually was. But yeah, it- remembering that first game and how we played the first time, it's quite possible that if we hadn't been on easy mode, we might have been utterly slaughtered because the game is difficult. Uh, Mm -hmm. In the normal mode, it is not easy and it's not supposed to be. No, I get I I think if we didn't get the extra time tokens, we probably would have lost. It it seemed like it. I don't know. But yeah, it was too easy. Now, as for the other bits, uh, besides the new campaign, I I don't have any complaints, right? Being able to play with six players is cool. New side mission cards are fine. I personally didn't mind the new hells, but our group was definitely split over it. Uh, most people did not like having to do silly things outside of the game, though Cat was really entertained by it. So those are take it or leave it. Uh, overall, though, like that 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 part being great, that's definitely not worth the price of entry just to be able to play a couple more characters, right? I sorry to say I can't recommend this. I can't recommend Legacy of Lopan for Big Trouble in Little China. Like we did have fun. We had fun playing through the campaign, but that fun fun was threatened repeatedly with problems and inconsistencies in the book, the game text. This made the entire experience feel unfinished and unpolished. And like, it just, it felt like I was playing an ash can, right? For the role-playing term. It just felt like a play test. I, I think the only thing that actually saved this game for us is the players who we were playing with. I, I think we would have had fun playing anything together. We could have brought out the Masters of the Universe role-playing game and had a good time, right? I think I would have hated playing this with a group of strangers at a local game night. It just happened that our group was going to have fun doing anything. Now, maybe if you are a huge fan of the original game, like I'm saying huge fan, like, oh, I play it all the time and I played through the scenario multiple times and I've tried all the characters, right? You really dig the original game and your group is comfortable making house rules and ignoring the inconsistencies and just rolling with it, then check it out. Sure, maybe you'll enjoy it. But even then, look for a sale. Like I, I agree with Sean here. I don't think this is $40 worth of content, even for fans. Now, for those of you who did get the deluxe box set, right? You bought the Kickstarter version and this came in your box. I'm not saying throw this stuff out. Like, if you've got it already, do check it out. Play around with it. Just be ready to deal with the inevitable inconsistencies and omissions from that book. For a more in-depth look at Big Trouble in Little China, Legacy of Lo Pan, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews.